what we're talking about today. Uh, that was just a freebie. <laughs> Um, so, if you uh, hopefully you have your Bibles, um, open up to Revelation chapter 7, because we are going to be talking about God's promises today, and, um, and trusting in God's promises, and, 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 and hoping and waiting on the Lord. Um, and so, over the last month, since looking through our, um, our mission, vision, and values statement as Legacy Church. And really kind of talking through who we are as a community, who we want to be, and what, um, what our mission is together. And so our vision is to be a life-giving community, serving those in need, and celebrating the goodness of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's who we want to be. And that's, that's what we are working towards. That is, that is what, we, um, what are we are hoping for for our community. And our mission which is to build a strong sense of community, um, to mobilize a strong sense of outreach, and to cultivate a strong sense of worship, is going to move us into that vision, right? Right. So um, today, we're we, we're or through this series, we're talking about the why and the how. Why we as Legacy Church, why this is our vision, and why and how our mission is going to get us there. Um, and so Brendan talked last week about um, evangelism and, and talking and, and mobilizing outreach in our, our personal sphere. And today, I have the privilege of talking about something that is very near and very dear to my heart, which is mobilizing outreach in the world. Um, so missions, so we'll be talking about missions today. So everybody say yay! Yay! Um, missions has been an impulse of my heart since I was a little kid. I, um, I grew up in the AG, so missions is a huge deal in the Assemblies of God, right? For anybody not familiar with the Assemblies of God, that's our denomination that this church is in. And uh, the denomination, missions, is a huge part of, uh, of our fellowship. And so um, as a little kid growing up in Assembly of God Church, we had missionaries come all the time. And it was my favorite Sunday. <laughs> I loved hearing the stories of missionaries. I would just, even as like a six-year-old, I was like, what? Like, God did what? God did what? Where? Like, what? Like, like it was crazy stories. I remember this one, uh, at least I think it was a missionary. I might be wrong because memories are weird. <laughs> um, but I remember hearing a story of um, people having to hide from people who were wanting to kill them. And they're like laying down in the grass and just praying that God would just... Um, hide them, and then the people looking for them just kind of walked over them and didn't see them, even though they were in plain sight. And I just, I, that, my, that, that has stuck in my head since I was a little kid, because I, like, I would hear these stories, and I would, um, I would come, I just wanted to do that. I wanted to trust God that much. I wanted to be in a place where I had no other option but to trust the Lord, Amen. right? And sometimes in the United States, we don't really have that. We, we, a lot of us never get to that place of complete dependence on the Lord because we have jobs, we have money, we have food. Like we, we don't think about having to depend on the Lord for everything we need. And I would hear those stories, and I was like, I want that kind of faith. And if I want that kind of faith, i got to be a missionary. <laughs> and so I wanted to be a missionary ever since I was a little kid. Um, and I wanted, and, and I also wanted to be the extension of my local church in a part of the world that needs the gospel. Um, so, um, because I'm here, I'm not, a cur I'm not currently a missionary, I realize that missions and missionary care is an important part of any church community. And for Legacy Church, we want it to be a vital part of our mission and values. Um, and so, um, and I believe that it's an impulse of my heart, and I believe it's an impulse of our church's heart because it's an impulse of God's heart, of going into the nations. Um, so lately, I've been spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation, and um, which is, um, it's, a, it's a very much misunderstood book, and for most of my life, I was pretty scared of it. <laughs> Anybody else? 
Um, like the book of Revelation kind of scared me. And, um, and I was like, I don't want to read it. I would, I, there was a long time I just didn't read it because I, it, I was like, nope, not going to touch it. <laughs> um, but, the, but the deeper I dig in the actual time I spend reading it, I, I recognize that, the, that Revelation is a book of hope. Revelation is a book of God's promises for, for us as his people. It's a, it's a book that tells us that God promises to return. He promises to make all things new, and he promises to um, be the conquering king for the people who follow him. And he also reveals that his kingdom is diverse, it's big, and it's filled with all ages all races, and all kinds of people. So um, let's, re- let's open uh, to Revelation 7, and we're going to read verses 9 through 17. After I looked, so, so here John looked and he saw the amount of people in his vision. He saw the amount of people that God had marked as his followers, as people who have his name written on their heads. And he, he, heard, he heard that it was 12,000 from each 12 tribes of Israel. But when he looked and he saw, this is what he saw. There was a vast multitude from every nation, from every tribe, people, and language. No one could number, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The multitude were dressed in white robes and palm branches were in their hand and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. All of the angels stood around the throne and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength to be or strength be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders asked me, who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. Then he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them. They will no longer hunger. They will no longer thirst. The sun will no longer strike them, nor will any scorching heat. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. He will guide them to springs of waters of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Amen? That is a picture of hope. That is a picture and a promise of God that one day he will return. One day, every tribe, every nation, people from all over the world will worship him in unison and unity because he is a God who keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. The kingdom of God will be filled with all people from every tribe, nation, and language. If we are a people that take God at his word... The kingdom of heaven is filled with all kinds of people. Then God will send people to proclaim good news to, of his kingdom to those who have never heard it throughout the world. Amen? Yes. Amen. The entire world needs to know the good news of Jesus. Amen. And as a church, as Legacy Church, we want to participate in this. We want to participate and trust in the promise of God that he's going to do this, and we want to participate with him to make it happen. We want to participate with God by mobilizing outreach in the world, by equipping, sending, and supporting missionary partners. We go into the world believing that God is working to bring this vision of revelation, this vision of the kingdom of heaven. We believe that he's going to do it through sending our missionary partners. We are saying we trust God that you are a God of your word. And because we go into the world, um, or our missionary partners go into the world, our missionary partners become an extension of us as Legacy Church. 
They are representatives of Legacy Church around the world. Because of their sacrifice, we want to love them well as they live in places where being a believer can be incredibly difficult. And so today we're going to be talking about talking through why we do this, why do we send and equip and mobilize outreach in the world, and how we can do it as Legacy Church. So um, let's start with this why. Um, so why do we equip for missionaries? Why is this so important and vital to us as a community? Why is it important for us to do is why is it important for us to do is we take God at his word. Well, the first reason is Jesus told us to. (laughs) Jesus commissioned us to go into the whole world. Um, So just before Jesus ascended, uh, after his resurrection, uh, he commissioned his disciples to a task. He said, he told them in Mark 16, 15, it says, Jesus said to the disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. In Matthew 28, it says, And Jesus came to them, to the disciples, and he said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God is true to his word. Amen? Amen. God longs that no one should perish. God longs that we all be saved. That's what the Bible says. And if the kingdom of heaven is an innumerable collection of people from every corner of the earth, then the gospel must go out to everyone in the earth. And the disciples, they took this commission extremely seriously. They left their jobs, they left their homes, they, they, they left and risked everything because they believed that Jesus was who he said he was. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the coming king, the one who has come to save them and redeem them and rescue them. And they wanted to participate and do what Jesus had asked, which was just go tell people. Go tell people that I'm here. The Messiah has come. Tell everybody my name. Tell everybody that I am the God of the universe come to save you from your sins. They were convinced and transformed by the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. And we have the book of Acts, which is a testimony of them doing this very thing. They They were disciples who made disciples, who made disciples, who built churches, who made disciples, and so on and so forth until you are in this very room because you are the of that commission right right so we are the current generation of disciples doing what Jesus has tasked us to do we are continuing this legacy of going into all the world to proclaim the gospel walking in obedience to what Jesus had asked us we are making disciples equipping sending and supporting global partners like I said, I, I'm an Assembly of God kid. <laughs> uh, uh, so this topic is one that formed me as a child, and I took it seriously. You know, Jesus said to make disciples, so I was the kid at school carrying a Bible and having discussions in my eighth grade social studies class about speaking in tongues. Yes. Like, <laughs> I yes. was all in. <laughs> I, I was the kid and I still am the kid, that when someone asked, what do you do, what do you want to do when you grow up? I would be like, I want to be a missionary. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I, so this, is, this, this, is a, this is a thing in my life. Um, so missions is the heartbeat of the, our denomination, and it's our legacy. This is why the Assemblies of God was, was, became a denomination, because they wanted to be people who sent people out into the world to make this vision of heaven a reality. We, like the disciples, want to take it seriously, too. We want to take serious this commission of Jesus and continue that legacy by sending and supporting those who say, I'll be a missionary. I'll do it. Let me go. So Jesus has given us this task, but this task also provides the opportunity to grow 
in our faith and to grow in our trust in God. So the first why we do this is because Jesus told us to, and the other is because it forms our faith. It forms our faith, and it celebrates the goodness of Jesus, and it helps us trust God more because it helps us say, yes, God, I continue to trust that this vision of heaven is going to be our reality. And because I trust that, I want to help make it. So I want to participate in it. So um, I saw this movie once. Has anybody seen Evan Almighty? (laughs) Yes. I, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but there's one scene that always like that is always in my head. Um, so Evan's wife is talking to Morgan Freeman, who's playing God, and she's talking, asking about patience. And Morgan Freeman, as God, tells her that, she's like, okay, if you want patience, do you think I'm just going to give it to you? Or do you think I'm going to give you opportunities to practice patience so that you can grow in your patience? This is very similar to that. It's, it's that exercising of faith. Is that if we want an opportunity to, to do what God has asked us to do, to what Jesus has tasked us, then God is going to give us opportunities to exercise that faith. God has promised he would come again. And we live with the belief that Jesus is who he said he was, and he will return. And when we believe that his words are right, and true in that he's faithful to his word, we, pra- we, we add to that faith of ours. So just like Revelation 7, 9 through 10, this is God's promise. To that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, And crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is what the kingdom of God is going to look like. So by equipping and sending and supporting missionaries, we are exercising our faith by believing that this is what God's going to do. This God is going to do what he says he's going to do, and we're going to participate with it. We are practicing our trusting in the Lord. And we're saying that we want to participate with what God is doing in the world. We want to be part of his renewal process. We want to be part of being witnesses to his kingdom come so that we can come back, so he can come back and make all things new. One day, we will be in full communion and worship of the Lord with believers from all around the world. And I cannot wait for that day. And until then... Got to practice that faith. <laughs> so and God is giving us opportunities every single day um, to take him at his word and trust in his faithfulness. But how? How do we participate with him? How do we just go and make disciples of all nations when moving to a different country and going into the world is not an option? Most of us in this room can't go out into the world. It's not practical for us to pick up our family, to pick up our lives and and move to a new country and do ministry cost culture. We go into all the world through our missionaries. They have said yes to the call. They've said yes to the call of God and through partnering with them in their ministries, we are participating in the Great Commission. Missionaries have taken Jesus at his word. They believe in this vision of a multi-ethnic, multilingual kingdom of God, and they made the decision to sacrifice everything they know to go to live in a place where they know nothing at all, trusting only in the Lord. They've made that decision to go and share the gospel with people who need it so that the kingdom of God can be filled with more and more people. They are working for freedom. They are soldiers on the front lines of ministry, pressing into places where the enemy does not want to let go. That he's fighting hard to keep, the, to keep for himself. They're fighting for freedom for those who are broken in places where the church presence is minimal. How many of you have um, 
seen those videos of soldiers coming home and, and surprising their families? Um, they never fail to make me cry, <laughs> right? Am I the only one? <laughs> I was watching a few yesterday when I was, I was prepping. I was like, oh my gosh, like an hour, I was just sobbing. I was like, <laughs> I, I, they just never fail, especially when it's like a, like a kid coming home and surprising their parents or a parent surprising their kid. I just, weeping. Some of you in this room know what it's like to be a deployed soldier to, sent to fight in the war. And some of you know what it's like to be the family member of a deployed soldier. And you know how lonely it can be, how hard it can be, how um, just heartbreaking it can be not knowing. All the not knowing is probably the worst part. Um, and um, we, just, we just know that sometimes when our soldiers come home, it's hard to talk about it because no one's going to understand what's happening and what happened. Um, I, I have a friend. I mean, throw up my, the, my cowboy picture here. So I was 16 in this picture. This was my soldier. Um, this is my friend, Tim. Uh, we, we met when I was 16, and this was right before he uh, went to basic training. Um, Tim would uh, write me letters, and I would write him letters, and he would ask me to send pictures and tell stories because that's what he lived on. He lived on stories from home and the hope of coming home. And the hope, like, cause, and he went to Iraq a few times. Um, he was deployed a few times in Iraq. But um, he, he would just tell me, he's like, just tell me anything. Write to me about anything. Tell me story. like, send me pictures. Because he needed the people back home. He needed us back home to, to hold on to while he was in a place of just difficulty and hardship, especially when he was in Iraq. Um, Tim is uh, unfortunately no longer with us. He passed away in 2012, but um, it, it wasn't, he, he passed away here at home. Um, so, um, yeah, so. <laughs> um, I, I miss him every day, but he, he helps, his story helps me realize sometimes what our missionaries go through too. Because our missionaries, um, they're like the soldiers who go, who are deployed into the nations, but they don't have other soldiers to keep them company. And they don't have people who are speaking English to keep them company. And they don't have a church that understands them in their heart language to really keep them company. So we participate in mobilizing outreach in the world by sending and supporting those who have made the decision to enlist in God's army. Because they have decided to make that ultimate sacrifice of giving up their lives, picking up their entire families and moving to a place where they know nothing. They're giving up all of the comforts of home for the purpose of advancing the gospel and, and trusting the Lord. For the only true freedom that we could have, which is freedom in Christ from sin and death. Being a missionary can be very difficult and very lonely. Um, when Corey and I first got married, um, we took a job at a Vietnamese church here in Portland. Um, and we weren't living in a different country, but we might as well have been because we were two small town kids living in Portland for the first time, which is a big culture shock, right? Yeah. We moved to the heart of Southeast Portland and we worked in ministry with a people group that did not do church in our language, did not function the way that we did. We, uh, we loved the Vietnamese church, but it was very hard because they did church differently. They did ministry differently. They didn't, um, the uh, uh, service was in Vietnamese, so we just sat there not understanding a word, and we were the only white people in our entire church. <laughs> we were the only non-Vietnamese people, and it just, it was hard because we were, a newly married couple moving to a place where we knew no one and to a church that we did not understand. Did not understand. And it was incredibly lonely. 
because we had no one checking in, up on us, and we had to learn how to be married alone with no one to really take us under their wings. And if it was lonely for us in the United States, I can only imagine how lonely and difficult it could be moving to where there's no relief anywhere. No place where you could just be like, oh, home. <laughs> Our missionaries need us to care about their lives and their experiences. And one of the ways we can step into our mission as Legacy Church is to participate in missionary care. Um, we, as a church, we have, um, we have, as a church, we tithe $1,000 a month to our missionaries, which is great, which is awesome. Hallelujah. That's a lot. But we have to split it between all of our missionaries, <laughs> right? Um, but we can do more. We can do more, not just financially, but we could do more relationally. We can, um, we, yeah, we can just do more. <laughs> um, Philippians 4, 10 through 20. Uh, in Philippians 4, 10 through 20. The love, care, and generosity of the Philippian church. As anybody who doesn't know, Paul was really the first missionary. He moved from place to place, and he went out and expanded and built churches, and he just kept going out farther and farther and farther. Um, in this passage, he tells the Philippians how, how, um, how thankful he is because they were one of the only churches to care for him. They sent him gifts. He, he was thankful for their generosity, and they, they sent him gifts so that he didn't have to worry about where his food was going to come from or where his money was going to come from or... Um, or he didn't have to worry about his needs because so that he could just go do what God has called him to do. And so they took it upon themselves as a congregation to help Paul practically so he could work what he could do what God had asked him to do. We have over 30 career missionaries at Legacy Church that we partner with globally. And our missionaries are not unlike our They've experienced the freedom that Jesus offers. They believe in the salvation that through Jesus is worth the risk, worth the hassle of working through the difficulty of living cross-culturally, and that the freedom of Jesus, that the freedom Jesus is so good, anything else but proclaim in whatever language they can learn. They experience fatigue, loss, sadness, and harsh spiritual warfare. Uh, Kyle and Nina were here a few weeks ago and shared just some of the stuff that they've been walking through. Oh, sorry. <laughs> some global workers here with us a few weeks ago. <laughs> and they shared just a little bit about some of the harshness because they've experienced so much spiritual warfare in the last couple years in their term. And it's been very very tiring. And what if we became like the Philippian church, how they were to Paul, that all of our missionaries can feel our love and our purpose for them and know that they are not alone, that they have come, that they have a church community to come back to in Oregon, to feel home to, to feel loved by and supported by. They, knew that they, they would love and cherish letters written to them, they would love birthday cards. They would um, love things sent to their kids and, um, and having their kids loved well. They would love to be known deeply to make sure that their bills are paid and, and that they have everything taken care of, even for the families they have back home. And most of all, they need us to pray for them daily. Because praying for them daily helps them grow in our faith and also covers them in faith when they're facing hard things. It connects us to the global church and it helps us live into our mission of mobilizing outreach in the world. So maybe you're listening to this and you're like, how can I do that? How can I? Well, come adopt a missionary. Come say, Robin, I would love to adopt a missionary. And I, we have single missionaries. We have 
marrying missionaries. We have missionaries with kids. We have, we have missionaries all over the world who would love to meet with you, who would love to build relationship with you. And, um, and you, you could come to me and tell me what they need prayer for instead of asking me. That would be awesome if I didn't know what they needed, but you did. <laughs> And you could tell me, I would love that, and they would love that, and it would, it would be a, a relationship that is 100% worth it. I will make it happen. I will make it happen for you. <laughs> um, another way to go into the nations and, and obey the command of Jesus is to equip and send missionaries. This is something that Legacy Church wants to do. We want to send and equip people out into the world. We don't want to keep people for ourselves because we're not here for ourselves. We're here to expand the kingdom. We're here to make that vision a reality that heaven is going to be filled with all kinds of people. And this is going to take intentional discipleship. It's going to take creating opportunities for missions exposure. Some of our kids are going to Ecuador this summer. Amen? Let's pray that one of them comes home with a call to missions. Yes? Yes. I'm praying for that. Join me. (laughs) It's also going to take intentional prayer that people in our community will say yes to the call. And it's going to take intentional encouragement to get them there. This is going to be very practical soon for our congregation because we actually have a family in our congregation currently applying to become missionaries right now. Um, So I have wanted to be a missionary all my life. Um, And when Corey and I got married, we knew that missions was going to be likely in our future. Um, We never knew when and we never knew how. And um, I had given up hope that God was going to tell me where I was going to go. So I was like, well, I'm just going to be where I be. (laughs) I guess I'm just going to be a missionary in the United States. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Which is is crazy because if you look at the statistics, the, the country in the world that has the most missionaries coming is the United States. And we have missionaries coming from all over the world to the United States. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, we wouldn't think that, but we are the biggest income missionaries in coming here. Now, I don't know how to phrase that, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and so I, I never knew where God was calling me, and I just was content with being where God has called me to be. So um, as, many of you know, as many of you know, I uh, went to Thailand last May um, to visit some of our global partners there. And um, I, God began speaking to my heart about missions again. And um, back in 2011, I went on a missions trip called the World Race. And God was doing a lot in me then because I was doing missions then. And I thought, for a long time, I figured that was my missions life. I was like, I was going for a year and then I was done. Uh, but... Um, while I was there, I was doing a lot of drawing. I'm, I love drawing and painting and art, and I was doing a lot of art um, in the spirit. And God was, I was drawing things, and I was giving God, like, God was giving me things to say to people as I give them this drawing. I'm like, oh, God said this. And they're like, that's exactly what God, that's exactly what I needed God to hear. Like, I've been praying for that. And it was happening all the time. Um, but there was one drawing I did that never had an interpretation to it. Um, that was the drawing. I was sitting, I was sitting in um, a church in Mozambique, and the whole service was in Portuguese, so I was just doodling. <laughs> and I was drawing, and I ended up just drawing this picture. And I had no idea what it meant. And there was no interpretation. And for the last 12 years, people have asked me, like, well, what does it mean? And I'm like, I have no idea. No idea. No idea at all. And so, and so 12 years, I've had this picture. I was like, maybe, maybe God wants me to work with Muslims or, or some, or I don't know. And so um, when I was in Thailand in May, um, I came across uh, a painting. And you can go to that other picture. I came across this painting. 
And the, the Holy Spirit instantly put in my mind my drawing that I did at a church in Mozambique in 2011. And in my heart, in that moment, when I saw this painting, I was like, huh, interesting. <laughs> God began to speak to my heart that he was going to be sending us overseas soon to this place <laughs> to work with the missionaries that came a few weeks ago. Um, so um, I came home because Corey was not with me. I came home and I was like, Corey, God spoke to me about something. And I need to know how you feel about it. Because if you don't feel this is right, this is not happening. <laughs> um, and so Corey and I have spent a lot of time praying over the last few months and a lot of time talking with each other and, um, and talking with the missionary unit that was here a few weeks ago. Um, and we feel like that's where God is leading us. And so um, we are currently working on applying to become missionaries. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we, our life, we got married knowing that this is what it was going to be our lives probably someday. And, um, but we were, we have been open to whatever that looked like. And I had resigned to the fact that it might never be overseas. But God is good in his timing. <laughs> And God is good with his faithfulness. Um, and just so everybody knows, it's going to take probably a year or two before we leave. So I'm not leaving tomorrow <laughs> or next month. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a bit because we have a lot of things to prepare for. Um, it's going to take a while, but w what we're going to need most is you guys. We're going to need you. We're going to need your prayers because spiritual warfare has already started. When you start walking in obedience to the Lord, the enemy does not like it. And it's already starting. <laughs> um, pray for our health. I have a lot of medical anxiety that came about during COVID, and it's gotten strong, and it's been really strong lately. So pray for me, because I am tired of being anxious and scared, because I don't want to be I want to depend on the Lord. You know, he's, he's called me to something, and I don't want fear to be in the way. Amen? Um, pray for Bailey, because... Um, and we have a substantial amount of debt that we need to pay down before we go. That's going to take time, and it's going to take prayer, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take effort, and we have to, we're going to have to raise a budget. Um, and so we're going to need you. We're going to need your love, and we're going to need your care especially after we leave. Because Corey has never spent time out of the country. <laughs> and not so, I, I think I'll be okay, but I'm worried about my family and how they're going to respond to not being somewhere that's familiar. We need people to check in on our families, especially Corey's mom, because she'll be alone. We're going to need help selling our cars. We're going to need help doing so many things. Helping us to go is how you can go to. And it's a way that you can stand on God's promise to renew all things and come back because his, his name is being proclaimed throughout the world. Jesus called us to go into the nations. Some of us it means sending and supporting, and for others, it means it's going to leave behind. It, it, for others, it means leaving behind all we know and go to a foreign land that God's going to show us. And we want to be a life-giving church, amen? amen? And the best way to be a life-giving church is to proclaim the name of Jesus and to all the world. We know. Oh, okay. Not today, Satan. We want to be a life-giving church. We, and being a life-giving church requires being active in the world. Because we know that the world needs Jesus. 
People in Thailand need Jesus. People in Turkey need Jesus. People in Montenegro need Jesus. Spain need Jesus. South Africa, Ethiopia, Iran, Dubai, they all need Jesus in church presence. And these are just some of the places that Legacy Church has presence in because we have missionaries there. Isn't that awesome? Romans 10, 11 through 15 says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a promise. How then will they call on him who they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless some are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. We move into the world because we trust a God that is true to his word. We trust a God that will come again. We trust a God who will renew all things, who will make all things new. And, and as Philippians said, that every, every what is it? <laughs> that every eye will see, every ear will hear, and every knee will bow at the name of Jesus what a glorious day that will be when we, and we look forward to that day when all people of every nation, every tribe, every language lives together in the kingdom of God. And, as, and I'm going to end with the last few verses of Revelation 7 in our passage, 15 through 17. They are before the throne of God. The multitude, the, the multi-diverse kingdom of God is before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Will you believe that, amen? We also believe that they will hunger no more and thirst no more, and the sun shall not strike them nor any scorching heat. Amen? Amen. We trust that. We trust that that is what God is going to do. And we also believe that the lamb is in the midst of the throne and that the lamb, Jesus, will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is why we do what we do. This is why we mobilize outreach. Because we believe that this is what we hope for. We believe that this is what our future holds. We believe that Jesus is coming back and he will make all things new. And we go out into the world and we share the good news to the world because we believe that this is our future. And we want every single person to have a chance to come before the throne of God. And we do that through mobilizing outreach in the world. By going, by going through our missionaries, by going ourselves, we got this. We got this because we trust in a God who's got this. We trust in the conqueror. So let us pray. <laughs> Holy Spirit, thank you for your sweet presence. God, we thank you that you are a God who keeps your promises. You are a God who never fails. And because you are a God who never fails and you are a God who keeps your promises, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will keep your promises that haven't come true yet. And that we rest on those promises knowing that you are faithful. And because we trust in you and because we trust in what is to come, we will want to partner with you now in order that that, to help bring that about. You are sovereign. And even if we didn't do this, God, you would still make it happen because even the rocks will cry out your name. 
but we want to participate with you in it and not be idle. We want to say, yes, God, we trust you. We trust you so much that we're going to go tell others about it because we can't do anything else. Because you are so incredibly good and you're so incredibly sweet. And it is worth every single thing that we can risk because nothing compares to what you have in store. In the name of Jesus, amen.